Hello there and welcome to a special LexisNexis podcast where we'll be discussing some of the latest and upcoming developments from Australia's Parliament. It's great to have your company. My name is Laurel Henning. I'm a Sydney-based senior correspondent for LexisNexis's regulatory news organisation, MLEX, and that's quite a mouthful. I'm part of MLEX's Asia-Pacific News Bureau, which is based in Hong Kong, and I report primarily on competition and data privacy and security issues. Joining me today in Sydney is Antoinette Dimitrova. Antoinette is LexisNexis's Head of Current Awareness for the Pacific, a role in which she wears many hats but also leads Capital Monitor, our flagship parliamentary monitoring service. Capital Monitor publishes every policymaking tick and tock that comes from Parliament House in Canberra and will be part of the focus of our discussion today. Great to see you, Antoinette. Thank you for having me. Antoinette, let's kick off our chat by looking at some of the latest policy developments from the Australian Labour government. Obviously, elected following a federal election in May of this year, the Labour Party came into office with some key promises. What have they delivered on so far that has really been catching your attention? A lot and not enough. The Prime Minister has said he wanted to prioritise climate change targets, the establishment of a federal anti-corruption body, as well as plans to mandate domestic violence leave and tackle worsening skills shortages. Uh, And all of that was meant to happen in his first 100 days in office. His government has delivered on all of those fronts and more with various initiatives and legislation either passed already uh, or in front of the parliament at the moment. While they have delivered on quite a few of their election promises, there's still quite a lot to do and so much of it is also unknown. Um, Take climate change, for example, and we've just come out of the um, COP27 in Egypt. The government has finally opened the door for Australia to be part of global discussions around this um, concept for a loss and damage fund to benefit developing nations that are most severely impacted by the impacts of climate change. The opposition is likely to turn this into a problematic issue, no doubt, with the Albanese government hoping to co-host the um, COP in 2026. um, This is becoming um, very likely that um, it is becoming very likely that they will support the concept. Um, but for now, there is no commitment made and how this is going to play out um, in the midst of adjacent domestic issues like energy price increases is going to be interesting to see. I mean, this um, is an area that we may see a lot of new developments for. We, um, for example, saw the head of Treasury, um, Stephen Kennedy, come out a couple of weeks ago to endorse market intervention on energy prices. Um, and this is no doubt um, going to result in new legislation for the energy sector if the government decides to go there. Yeah, energy policy, obviously a very contentious issue in Australia, indeed the downfall of previous governments. Uh, Okay, so these are some of the key promises that have been delivered. So what about what we should be expecting in coming months or even next year into 2023? Okay, well, again, there is so much going on on all fronts, including domestic and um, international policy. Um, The government is toying um, with ideas for tax reform, for example, industrial relations reform, cybersecurity, and so, so much more. Um, For example, there are various reviews that are currently in various stages of progress, looking at a broad range of issues from maritime legislation through to modern slavery and or privacy protection, which are likely to pop out in the coming months. And privacy protection, obviously, an area of common interest for both Capital Monitor and MLEX, of course. The Privacy Act review, um, we've seen some recent developments there. I mean, that review has been ongoing since 2020, and we should highlight that Australia's Privacy Act itself dates all the way back to 1988. This review since 2020 has been pretty slow, but really spurred on recently by some mass data breaches, of which there have been many actually this year in Australia, but two have really grabbed headlines in recent months. One involving uh, telecom operator Singtel Optus, and the other involving a health insurer Medibank, uh, both particular drivers of recent updates. What can you tell us about those, Antoinette? Look, the um, reaction has been quite severe from the government, that is, um, and the general consensus is that um, these breaches could have easily been um, prevented. Um, There is likelihood for increased um, regulation driven by government intervention. And um, as we've seen in the short term, this has resulted to higher penalties. 
Yes, indeed, from my own reporting, this has been really interesting to watch this sort of fast-paced knee-jerk response, which involved these penalty increases to the Privacy to the Privacy Act, which had actually already been on the table for some time. Now, if we look to Australia's closest regulatory partner, New Zealand, the Australian penalties now are way above what exists over the Tasman uh, in New Zealand, where a maximum penalty for a corporation stands at 10,000 New Zealand dollars. It also brings Australian Privacy Act penalties in line with maximum competition and consumer law penalties, which were recently increased around the same time. So now, uh, going back to the Privacy Act review, Attorney General Mark Dreyfus has said he wants, I, I think, to finish this review or at least move it forward next year with some proposals. And that's going to be really interesting for both of us, I'm sure. Absolutely, Laurel. Um, it will be super interesting and uh, no doubt will be keeping you busy. Um, what else has been keeping you busy, though? <laughs> well, from a parliamentary perspective, I think these penalty increases, both privacy and competition consumer law, are very significant. We've heard um, a little bit of pushback from some of my MLEX sources over exactly why the competition penalties were increased rather than the consumer law. The competition ones had some criticism particularly. I think one source said to me they've gone from silly to really silly. But this is certainly a win for uh, the ACCC, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, after a long-term campaign from this regulator, which is, which is going to really be hoping to see uh, federal court penalties significantly increase once this legislation comes into force. Otherwise, I would say the development of the National Anti-Corruption Commission is without a doubt going to be something that we continue to watch very closely. Absolutely. And um, on that note, of course, a um, um, parliamentary committee report has just been published on this. What are your key takeaways? Yeah, that's right, Antoinette. The parliamentary joint committee working on this handed down a final report on the proposed powers for the National Anti-Corruption Commission earlier this month. And the deputy chair of that committee, Helen Haynes, said the commission must not be a toothless tiger when it's set up. Nice little quote there from Helen Haynes. Um, And the, the committee outlined six sort of key recommendations in its report. But there wasn't a change in that report to the controversial proposal to hold public hearings only under exceptional circumstances. Yeah, with with two weeks left of sitting, the government is hoping to pass this legislation before Parliament rises um, for the year in a couple of weeks. Um, The National Anti-Corruption Commission is expected to be fully operational by mid next year. It was budgeted for in October, after all, and the government would want it up and running as soon as possible. Um, But another bill to watch out for is the Industrial Relations Bill, Fair Work, Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill, which which um, really goes to the heart of Labor election promises to improve ordinary Australians' um, wages. Debate is likely to focus on resolving the contentious multi-employer bargaining aspect of it currently at a standstill, with some suggestions flying around that the government splits the bill to pass aspects um, from it that everybody agrees on um, and leave the rest till early next year for some additional debate. Right, so there's so much for us to be looking out for in 2023. But I guess for now, Antoinette, thanks for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Laurel. Antoinette Dimitrova is LexisNexis's Head of Current Awareness for the Pacific and, of course, the leader of LexisNexis's Capital Monitor Service. She's based in the nation's capital, Canberra. Thank you for listening to this summary of our parliamentary coverage from both MLEX and Capital Monitor. I'm MLEX Senior Correspondent Laurel Henning, and from me and everyone at LexisNexis, thanks for your company. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.